Hello, and welcome to our program today. Um, my name is Benina Stern, and I'm the assistant in the programs department here at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. So for those of you who may not know us here, we are a cultural center and a museum rooted in the Jewish values of welcoming all, pursuing justice and building community. Uh, we believe that by sharing stories, we are helping to provoke greater empathy, which we hope ultimately leads to a more just society. Um, you are here for a post-film viewing Q&A of They Ain't Ready For Me with Brad Ch Rothschild, the film's director, and Tamar Mansa, who is um, who the documentary follows. And here's a little bit about them. Uh, director and producer Brad Rothschild is an award-winning win filmmaker whose work focuses on the role of the individual in society. He received a master's in international affairs and an MBA, both from Columbia University in the mid 1990s, he served as the speechwriter and director of communications for the mission of Israel to the United Nations. Brad produced the documentary feature Kinder Block 66, Return to Buchenwald. The film screened at the Jerusalem Film Festival and over 20 festivals in the United States and around the world. Brad directed the documentary film African Exodus about the plight of Israel's African refugees and the documentary film Tree Man about the people who come to New York City to sell Christmas trees every holiday season. Tree Man won the Audience Award at St. Lawrence Film Fe International Film Festival and screened on Netflix. Brad's written um, work has appeared in The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, The Huffington Post, and The Times of Israel. Following the shooting death of Lucille Barnes in 2015, Tamar Manza, a mother of two who grew up in Inglewood and now lives in Bronzeville, rallied several other mothers and established mask mothers or men against senseless killings. In the summer of 2015, Manasa and other parents in the community took to their local corner daily to let everyone know that they're watching. Mask's purpose is to put eyes on the streets, interrupt violence and crime, and teach children to grow up as friends rather than enemies. Mask's primary mission is to build stronger communities through a focus on violence prevention, food insecurity, and housing. Additionally, Mask partners to ensure that community members have access to necessary city services, opportunities for education and professional skills and growth, and economic development. Uh, Manasa, Manasa also has helped uh, launch mask initiatives in Chicago and other Chicago neighborhoods, as well as cities throughout the nation, including Evansville, Indiana, uh, Staten Island, New York, and Memphis, ten Tennessee. Uh, please submit any questions you may have uh, with the Q&A function in Zoom. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Brad and Tamar. Thank you. Uh I guess I could speak for both of us and say that we're both excited to be uh, with Skirball tonight, and we wish that we could be in LA with you, but of course, uh, the pandemic is what it is. Hopefully, next time around, we'll be there. Right. That How are you, Tamar? Good. I'm good. How you doing, B? I'm doing okay. That's good. That's good. So, so how's the weather there? Everything is good. It's not as good as in LA, I'm sure, but... Uh, how is it in Chicago? It's 80 degrees and humid in Chicago. Yes. You know how many people going to get shot tonight? <laughs> that's, that's how, that is the first thing I think about when I think hot weather. It's beautiful out. But all I can think about is, oh, my goodness. I can, I can only imagine what it's going to be like in the morning, what the what the totals of the shootings are going to be tonight. It's going to be nuts. So I don't know. I mean, like, cross your fingers. Let's hope for it. Let's just pray for a good night. So let me ask you, what does that mean for you and for mask if tonight is warm weather and people are outside and there's more of a chance of, of violence occurring? What is what will happen on 75th and Stewart tonight? Um, I, you know what? Hopefully 75th and Stewart will be quiet. That's what I'm hoping for. But if it's not, I, you know, I think that after all of this time that we've been over there doing what we do, and it's not about us going there doing what we do there. I think the neighborhood, so many people in the neighborhood are involved in what we do. We're a part of the neighborhood. They're a part of mass. I don't I think the people in the neighborhood want something different. So I don't think that it's going to be um, violence necessarily on the block. I'm worried about what happens when kids from my block go to other blocks. 
when they go to other places, when they go downtown, when they're riding down Lakeshore Drive, when they're out on, you know, South Chicago hanging out, I'm worried about what happens then. When they pull up at a gas station, I'm worried about that. I'm not so much worried about what happens on the block because, I mean, everybody there has home training. Everybody there knows, ain't no shooting over there. We don't do that there. That's not what happens here. But I am very, very worried about what happens when, I mean, these kids leave their neighborhoods, when they leave their block to go into the city to enjoy the weather. I'm really worried about that. So, I mean, it's going to be a long night for me. I'm going to be up because I'm waiting on phone calls. Hopefully I don't get any, but I'm going to be on pins and needles. Can you, before you started mask, would you have reacted the same way to the thought of increased violence on any given day in Chicago? You know, I might've reacted similarly, but I wouldn't have cared as much because at that point I only had two kids. I had Ivy and Max and that was it. But it's like now I have 200 kids. So I care about all of them and I care about their friends, their friends, friends. When it's just your kids, that's one thing because, you know, it's like if they're both at home, safe and sound, everything, all is quiet on the home front. You're not so worried because your kids are at home. You're not thinking about everybody else's kids because your kids are at home. But now the thing is, I mean, my kids are adults and it's like, you know, they're out in the world still. They, they are just like every other young person in the city. They want to enjoy the weather. I mean, it's a pandemic. It's been, I mean, Chicago has brutal winters. I mean, we had like two feet of snow like last month. It was just, it's madness. So people want to get out. They, I mean, they, they have cabin fever. They want to get out. They want to have fun. They want to have a good time. They want to go sit on the patio. They want to enjoy friends. They want to do all of these things. However, with the violence, it just doesn't necessarily allow for that. So I'm assuming that people who are participating tonight in uh, the discussion have watched the film and know a little bit about Mask and about the work that you've done uh, to prevent gun violence on the south side of Chicago. So I won't go too deeply into those questions, at least for now. Let's, let's take a step back and talk about the film. Okay, so we'll start from the beginning, the origin of, of how the film came to be made. Um, in October of 2016, I sent you an email and I introduced myself as a filmmaker in New York City and I had read about you uh, in the JTA and an article called Black Rabbinical Student Leads Army of Moms Against Gun Violence on the South Side of Chicago. Wait, I'm sorry. Just let me interrupt you. Let me stop you right there. How ridiculous is that title? Uh, Isn't that title? That is just the most ridiculous title ever. Just it, say it again. Cap it captures everything. Though. And take it in. That is one. I mean, that is so it's, it's just like, what kind of person must this be? What if you had to draw a picture of me after no. reading that title? What would that picture have looked like? Well, <laughs> fortunately, there was a picture of you in the article, so I knew what you looked like. Uh, I don't know if I could have drawn a picture of you had I not seen what you, what, who you are, but I don't know how I would have thought somebody would look based on that description. But I, I reached out to you because I was intrigued by the title, by the article, by you, by the work that you were doing. Uh, and I thought that you would be a good subject for a film. So, you get this email, uh, among other correspondence that I, I reached out to you a, a few different ways. The Skywriter, the smoke <laughs> signals. Yeah. Yes, I got what, them all. What did you think? I thought you were insane. And I was a little frightened. I mean, I was a little frightened. I was also kind of flattered. So, I mean, hey, we always have that. But if, at first, you didn't really want to do a film. No, no, no. This, you know, this seems so normal to me this what i do every day it doesn't seem like it's something it's anything heroic it's anything unusual it's anything that other people can't do it seems that i mean it's just coming it's just like hey this is what my grandmother did did my grandmother ever have a movie nope did my mother ever have a movie no so why do i deserve one that is the way that i saw it it was just kind of like this is what i do i mean there's nothing interesting about this i'm sitting on the corner cooking dinner there's nothing fascinating about that that was but yeah, I didn't get it. 
Well, at least for me, part of what was intriguing was your backstory. And the part of the article that really spoke to me was when you talked about how it's your Judaism that led you to become an activist. And that's, I think, what I wrote to you that, you know, that, that I was interested in. And did that make a difference? Oh, that made a huge difference. You know, um, the George Floyd trial is going on right now. You know, I've been glued to the TV every yeah. day watching that. And when last week, when all of the witnesses were testifying who were on the scene and it was black people and it was young ones and old ones and kids and elderly people, just everybody. And what I kept hearing was um, helplessness. Everybody felt helpless watching the police do what they did to George Floyd. They felt helpless. They watched, I mean, they feel guilty now because they couldn't do more because they didn't do more. Everybody is feeling some sort of remorse, some sort of survivor's guilt or something because they felt helpless when they stood there and watched him die. But they couldn't do anything because the police were telling them to stay back. And did they want to end up with knees on their necks too? No. So they stayed back. So a lot of times that's what happens to black people. We see how other black people are made the example. They're the example and we stay back and we feel helpless. That's what we do. And the thing about it is it's not just in situations like that. It's every day. It's in every neighborhood across this country. We all feel helpless. Every time a police car gets behind us and we see those lights, even if we don't see the lights, even if we aren't getting pulled over, just when the police are behind us, your heart rate speeds up. You put your hands at 10 and 2, you turn your radio down. You want to do everything you can to make sure that you get home safely because the last thing you want to do is get pulled over because you have no idea how that's going to turn out. It is it is a fear that other people will never actually know or understand. And it is a helpless it's helplessness. We can't do anything about that. We pay taxes to be made to feel like that in our communities. We actually pay the salaries of the people who make us feel that way. What makes you feel more helpless than that? I pay for you to bully me. I pay for you to make me feel threatened. I pay for you to scare the crap out of me every time I see you. I pay for you to do what you did to George Floyd. I pay you to do that to me. What, I mean, is there a bigger, what will make you feel more helpless than that? You can't even say, hey, you know what? I don't want to pay these people for that. They don't protect me. They don't respect me. I don't want to pay them to do that. But you can't, you still have to pay your taxes. And the thing about it is, we we feel like that every day but being a jew what being jewish is it is solutions it is this idea of tikkun olam it is the idea of the world being imperfect and it's your job to help perfect it it's it's cracked and it's your job to help fill these cracks and to fix the world to repair it so it's solutions it's not problems it's cracks everywhere they're not problems they're just cracks and so it's your job as a Jew to help fix these cracks, to help fill these cracks, to repair the world. So there's always a solution. For Jews, there's always a solution. And if you don't have a solution at the moment, it's your job to spend the rest of your life trying to come up with one. Like that is like something that we're commanded to do. It's a rule. You actually have to do this. And it's kind of like, I don't feel like other people are compelled to do it the same way that we are. Like, you have to, like, this, this is something you have to do. This is the work. And you have to engage in the work when you're a Jew. You have to. This is what your life is about. So I see all of the issues. I see all of the cracks. I see the gun violence. I see the poverty. I see the police brutality. I see everything sitting on that corner. But as a Jew, I also see solutions. I also have Speckle. I have putty. I have a knife. I have a hammer and I have some nails and I can fix stuff because that's my job as a Jew to figure out how to fix these things, to not see them and get so bogged down under the weight of it that it becomes too big and too heavy of an issue or so big of a crack that I fall into it. It's it's I can't do that. That's not what we do. That's not what I was taught to do. So I think the way that I go about problem solving is a very Jewish thing. And so I look at I look at the same issues that everybody else in my community sees every day. However, we just see it from two different perspectives. They see problems and I see cracks. 
and they need these solutions and I just need a hammer and nails. So that's kind of how that works for me. So when originally you said you weren't interested in, in doing the film, what made you change your mind? You, you, you made me change my mind. When you finally took two hours to get to Staten Island, when I, that day I finally said I would meet with you in Staten Island, and it took you two hours to get to me. Remember that day? That yeah. day. Yeah. It, it's not that. close to where I live, by the way. I, I understand. I understand. But it wasn't close to where I lived either. Staten that's Island right. is nowhere near my block. Yeah. Right? Right? So that's fair. So. So, so what was it that made you decide to do you, this? You were a kid that I went to Jewish day school with all grown up. That's what it felt like. You were one of the kids who I dive in with every day, who I have Mishnah class with every day. You were one of those kids who I got kicked out of class, Ms. Glaberson's uh, Deke Duke class. You were that guy, like you were that prob that, that person. And it was like, wow, so this is what happened to Mickey when he grew up, I always wonder what happened to him. You, this is him. But it was just a kindred spirit. And I felt like I wasn't being judged. And I felt like I wasn't an oddity and I felt like it wasn't somebody who had me under a microscope and somebody who was was conducting some sort of purity test. I felt like you saw my humanity and you were OK with me being a Jew and I was OK with you being one. And it's 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 rare that I make connections like that, that I meet people who allow me to be me and I'm OK with who they are and we can have it the same space at the same time. That's 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 not something I see often in Chicago. Chicago is still a very segregated place. And it doesn't matter that we're Jews. It's still white people live over there and black people live over here. So if you're not if black Jews live over here with the black people and white Jews live over there with the white people. So even though we're Jews, when we come together, it's still that issue. It's still that sticking point. But it's like, you know, when we sat down and we talked and we talked and we talked, it was like that didn't matter. It was like the the bond of 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 spirituality, the spiritual bond, the bond of religion, the bond of faith was stronger than that of race. And that doesn't happen often. So that's why I did the movie, because I felt like I knew you my whole life. It's funny because once you told me that you went to Jewish day school, I felt the same way that I said to myself, I know this person because I went to Jewish day school. So we speak the same language. And I'm not talking about Hebrew. I'm talking about this language of Jewish day school. Yeah. We understood each it's other. It's unique. It's unique. Yeah. So yeah. I also felt like, okay, I know who this person is. She may not be like the people I went to Solomon Schechter with in New Jersey, but she is. Uh, so were there any concerns that you had before going into this? When, once you said, okay, I'll, I'll make this film, but before we started actually filming, like what were your biggest concerns? Um, the opening up my life to, to just the judgment and the opinions of the world. You know, like it, it, it's, it's a very personal thing to have someone bring a camera into your home where you live, where your family lives. It's, that's very personal. And I mean, just to just into your life, it, everything is up for judgment when it's in a movie. And it's kind of like I was a bit concerned about that. You know, how how am, what are people going to say? How's my family going to feel? What kind of that was just an unknown for me because I am a very private person. So having a movie was like, whoa, like that's a whole lot of information to divulge all at one time. And so how did your family feel about it? Um, my family thought that I was going crazy, that clearly you're insane. Like, and, and once again, even them, they were kind of like, why does he want to make a movie about you? You need to Google this guy and find out more about him. Are you sure he's not trying to traffic you? Like, why does he want to make a movie about you? You, you don't do anything. What is that is, but that's how, you know, your kids see you. You're, you're boring and you're unfunny yeah, it, it, and it's keep you honest. Yeah. And all of those things, it was just like, wh why does this person want to? You really need to check him out. If he wants to do a movie about you, it's something it's something wrong with that guy. That, that was kind of how they felt about it. And then so once we got started, did everybody sort of get comfortable with the idea? OK, so once we got started, this is for all of the people listening out there watching. OK, so once we got started, so my daughter is like, you know, she's uh, an adult, so she's in and out all the time. So sometimes I mean, I don't know, she we 
kind of two ships passing in the night all the time. I can go days and days without seeing her, but she still lives with me and everything. But it's just like that. So one day she comes into my bathroom and she's kind of out of breath. And she's like, oh, my God, mommy, there's a white guy sitting in the kitchen and he's talking to another white guy on his computer. And Max is missing. And I couldn't make the connection because Brad had been filming at that point for what, Brad, two, three months. Yeah, it was not early. No, it was a while. So and she it, met me. It's I mean, like it took her all of this time to realize that there is a whole movie being filmed in your home about your mother with your brother in it. And like she was just like, I don't know what is happening. Max is missing and it's a white man in the kitchen and I don't know what's happening. And I, for a minute there, I thought like, oh, my God, it's a white man in the kitchen and Max is missing. And then I thought about it and I'm like, he's not white. He's Brad. That's Brad in the kitchen and Max is not missing. But I thought that was hilarious. So that tells you just how in tune my family was with this movie being shot in our home. But Max is a very private person, for example. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, from my perspective, once I understood that who he is and what he, his boundaries were, I was fine. Uh, you know, he said, you can film me. I'm not going to sit for an interview, but you can film me. And I was totally fine with that. And, and you know, there are people when they talk about the film, they're like, well, I wish we would have known more about Tamar's kids. And sometimes I have to remind people, this isn't really a biography of Tamar Manasseh. And it's not, you know, a tale of her family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from my perspective, I felt like you were so gracious in terms of giving me access to your whole life and your family also is so great. And I have a great relationship with Max and I wouldn't want to do anything to disturb that relationship or upset that relationship, but I would never ask him to participate in something that I know he is not comfortable with. Yeah. So, I mean, I would, it would never even occur to me, like once I understood that what his boundaries were, that's fine. Like we don't need to, we don't need to interview Max. We don't need to, to, you know, Max and I talk a lot, just not on camera. Yeah. And yeah. that's okay. He is um, one of those people who is really a doer. Like he's not a talker at all, yeah. but he's a doer. He's the first one there, the last one to leave, the most committed, and he'll never say a word about it. He doesn't need to talk about it. He doesn't need the world to know about it. He doesn't need to be interviewed. He doesn't need any of that. And I mean, like that is, I, 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 that just endears him so much more to me because he is that way. He doesn't need the shine. He doesn't need for me to say, hey, you know what? This is my son, Max, and he's really, really great. And come meet the people. He's not that. If he could be invisible, he would be. He, he would be. If there was a real cloak of invisibility out there, I mean, and as Jews, everybody knows we have one. Some of us, you may, your, didn't your family make the weather machine or was it the lasers? Which we one? Lasers. We have the, lasers. The and lasers. The, we have both, actually. And, and yes, and the weather machine. So I know that as Jews, we can create, somebody has created a cloak of invisibility. So if anyone yeah. has one out there, they can hook me up with one, send one my way. But he is a, he is just the perfect kid for, for the life that I have. It's like God gave me, if, if I was asked if I could, what kind of kids would you want? And if I was able to pick the kind of kids that said, okay, I want them to have this, 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 and that before they were born, I would have really cheated myself because I could never imagine getting the kind of kids that I actually have. They're so amazing. I mean, like I could have never even imagined kids like this before. I, no one could. So what was it like for the people uh, on 75th and Stewart, once uh, I showed up with the camera, how did they, how do you think they felt about having a camera there regularly? Uh, they thought you were the feds at first. <laughs> you were the police or the feds. You were some law enforcement. You were from some law enforcement agency. But then I had to calm everybody down because everybody knows I don't do that. Like, I'm not that person. So I wouldn't, why would he be around me if he was a fed? That would never happen. So, um, the thing about them, I think after a while, honestly, 
the camera made them feel safer. It actually made them feel safer because what we all learned um, in our first season on the block, on our first summer, there was a girl um, who was a student, had, she had just wrapped up her film studies at Northwestern and she would come to the block every day in video. And we learned very early on, cameras keep everybody honest. It keeps people safe because police don't want to come and, and, you know, hem the guys up on the block when there's a camera there. And no one wants to come and shoot anybody when there's a little Asian girl on a corner with a camera. Like nobody wants to be the guy that shoots the Asian kid on 75th and Stewart on a corner with the camera. Nobody wants to be that guy. And nobody wanted to be the person to shoot Dan Coleman when he was shooting this film or to shoot you when you were out there. It, 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 made, it made people safer because once again, the police don't want to show up and do the things that they do um, and violate the civil liberties of those boys on that block and violate their rights when there's a camera there and there are two white men. No one wants to do that. So after a while, they learn, oh, today, tomorrow's filming. Oh, like everybody can come outside today. The camera's going to be outside. So you actually, it, it actually became a bit of a, a defense mechanism, kind of. I have to say that I had, I never felt anything but welcome when I was out there. You know, people have asked me like, oh, were you scared to go to 75th and Stewart or what was it like? You know, and I really felt that because I was there with you, that since I had your seal of approval, that everybody was just okay with me because, you know, you are the mom of the block. And if, if you say I'm all right, then I must be all right. And I feel like and that goes a long way. And it really helped it to make this into the film that it became. And and they know. I mean, they can trust me. I, I mean, by the time you start coming around, I've been there for a while, and everybody knows you can trust me. You can trust me. If something was going to happen, and I was going to be the one who you know bought about the end of whatever it is that you're doing on this block or how whatever, it would have happened a long time ago. It wouldn't, this wouldn't be something that, you know, it would take this long and then I would bring someone with a camera and it wouldn't go that way. So they trust me. Yeah. So what was the biggest surprise you had making this? Like, did you learn anything? I think the biggest surprise that I had making this is when we went to North Carolina. Yeah. And um, we were out in the country in Robeson County, remember? Sure. And oh, Robinson County. Sorry. And wrong. we were no. Remember the guy corrected us and said <laughs> we can tell you're not from around here. It's Robinson County. Remember? Yeah. But um, when we were, when it got dark and we were out in the country in like the rural area, and you said we have to get back to the city. We can't be caught out here. People that they don't like people that look like me out here. They can't catch people that look like me out here at night. And and that that wow, that like that that hit me because the thing about it is you're you're white. And to hear somebody white say, people like me can't be caught out in the dark in the south at in at night. We can't just be out in the country and you know, just riding around. Bad things happen. They don't like people like us out here. Black people have been worried about night Riders and Klansmen and everything else for the longest. That's that's always been a fear of ours. But to hear somebody who is white say the same thing, to know that we have the same boogeyman, the same monsters under our beds, that just got me. That got me to understand. And then, you know, fast forward to Charlottesville. And it's like, exactly. Like Jews will not replace us. These are the these are the people who Brad was talking about when he said people like us can't be out here, you know, in the middle in at dark, after dark. We have to get back to the city because what if people like those people caught us out there? Two black women and two white Jewish men in a car together in the middle of North Carolina out in the country. What happens? And so that was really another one of those things of um, those examples of us being more like than different than I'd, I'd realized before. Well, I think I, I told you that, you know, I went to school, you know, I went to school in Atlanta. And before I went to school for the first time, my parents gave me the talk. 
you know, when I when I drove down there, they said, you need to be careful because you have license plates that say you're from New Jersey. And if you get pulled over, your last name is Rothschild. So, you know, you need to know where you are. And it's something that uh, I don't think most white people ever hear the talk, but I would think every black person hears a version of the talk. Brad, I still, you know, I go down south pretty frequently. And I still, in 2021, if I got in my truck right now and I drove down to Mississippi to see my family, I would still take the Green Book route that my father took that my uncles took, that they took when they came from Mississippi, I would still take that route. And before my father died, he would get so upset with me when I would stop in places that that he wasn't familiar with, in places that he was taught never to stop at. So even now it's like, well, it's not like that anymore. But for him, it was like, no, it's always gonna be like that. You can't stop there. So it's so funny that now when my kids go, I only let them stop at the at the green book stops. And it's kind of like that was from the Jim Crow era. That was 50 years ago. But that still is 2021 and black people are still teaching their kids. Don't stop everywhere. These are the safe places to stop. That's something. It's something that that's supposed to not even be a thing anymore. That's still very real for black people. Uh, when I first showed you a cut of the finished film, what did you think? Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> That's what I thought. Oh my God. Oh, like there was so, because you know, for every scene, there's a backstory for every scene. Yeah. So it's like remembering the backstories and it's like reliving like all of the backstories. And it's like, oh my God, I, mean, I had a hangover that day. Like it is, yeah, it's like that, like all of those times. But the thing is, it took a minute for me to realize people can't see, um, they can't see the backstory, only you can. All they can see is this beautiful picture that Brad has painted of the community, of this love letter on film that Brad has written to the block. And it is, it was once I got over myself, it was beautiful. So you're happy with how it turned out? Nah, you could have did better. But I mean, it's not bad, okay? It's, I, yeah, you know, I was- It's a B plus. <laughs> really? It, I mean- If we're gonna be honest with each other. And if I wasn't in it, it would have been like a D. But I mean, if hey- you, you were in it, there's no film. Sorry, I mean, Brad. I mean, next time. Saying, don't worry, next time you're going to get an A. We're going to make sure you get an A next time. So I, what do you hope that people take away from this B plus film? <laughs> That's what we're going to start calling it, B plus, the B plus, yes. But um, I, I hope people take away, honestly, that, that um, anybody can do something. Everybody can do something, that we all have something inside of us. And sometimes it's kind of like I thought, like, hey, there's nothing special about this. And it took for somebody to say, oh, no, 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 there's something different about this. And this is something that the world needs. And it's kind of like sometimes people need that kind of encouragement. And everybody has something that they can offer. Everybody has something that they can offer, some kind of tool that they have in helping to repair the world. Everybody has a special tool. Everybody, the world is a big place to have to repair. So it takes a lot of different kinds of crafts, craftsmen. It takes a lot of different hands, a lot of different workers. It takes a lot of different approaches to it. And so everybody has something special and unique that they can offer. They just have to offer it. People always, they wanna do something. They just don't know where to start. And my thing is to just start. I mean, literally I started with like a pink t-shirt and a barbecue grill on a corner. Like, I can't think of anything more simple than that. Just. I hope people just start. Yeah. Do you think that the film has become more timely since we finished filming? Or do you think it was always timely? I think the film was always timely. I just think the world finally caught up with it. I mean, yeah. it, it's been, all of this stuff has been going on forever. And it's kind of like now 
people are seeing it in the movie and it's like okay well this has been happening in the hood like since like the hood was the hood since forever and it's just like now with with camera phones and social media now the world is catching up to it and now it's like whoa this is amazing but nope it, this is this has been happening the whole time yeah and i guess the reason i'm asking is because you know we started showing this around the country virtually uh, we started last summer, right around the time. Of, around May, right? Yeah, I think a little bit later. We had a couple of screenings before the pandemic. And then it was really like June, July, where we started to show it. Um, but it was after the George Floyd murder. It was after the Breonna Taylor murder. It was after the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests started uh, in the summer. And people sort of felt like this film was part of that larger story. Yeah. You see it like that? No, I and see it like, I mean, I see myself as all of those people. I see all of those boys in that movie that everybody met in the movie, Jermaine is George Floyd. Uh, Nutta is jo George Floyd. Any of those kids can be George Floyd. And any of those girls, including myself, can be Breonna Taylor. That That's just how it goes. The movie, this movie was made before those things happened, but those things have been happening forever. My uncle was shot in the back by police when he was 15 years old in 1959. So, I mean, it's kind of like, this has kind of always been a thing for us. Do you see things changing now as a result of what happened last summer? Um, happening? You know, I'm hoping that things are changing and I think we'll be able to see whether or not things are really changing when we hear what this verdict is gonna be in Minnesota. I think that's when we really find out because um, if you look at Georgia, we are on the cusp of a second civil rights movement. We are on the cusp of Freedom Summer 2021. This is Jim Crow, it's happening again. So as much as things, as much as we're thinking that things are changing, Georgia is saying, oh no, 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 it's not. No, it's not changing. We're rolling it back. So that's what we have to watch. In Minnesota, we, we see what the verdict is coming out of there. Maybe that says things are changing and you know things can get better. But in Georgia, it's saying, no, we still are gonna keep Negroes where they belong, in their place. And you know, out of, out of the voter booth, we're still gonna keep them there. So that's kind of, it's like in one way, it looks like we're making so much progress, but then in another, not so much. And, and so what does that mean for mask? Um, which part? The part about things needing to be fixed still. And well. You're talking about Georgia and talking about voter suppression. And I mean, and, and okay, I mean, for me, um, I understand that voter suppression is, I mean, that's that's a big deal. Um, my great aunt actually ran the boarding house where Mamie Till Mobley used to stay when she would go to Mississippi for um, the trial for Emmett Till, for the, the, the guys that killed her son. And like in my family, like that was their thing. Like they were, and that was in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And that was like their thing. They were really into black people voting. And it was always for me and my family, that was the one thing everybody wasn't jewish and we weren't all christians and we weren't all catholic and we weren't all with you know we were made up of all different stuff but politics was the religion of my household election day was the most sacred day of the year and everybody had to go vote and it was like i was so i grew up looking forward i didn't care about getting my driver's license i cared about getting a being able to vote turning 18 so i could vote Sure, being able to drive is good, but I can vote. That is when I really felt like I had power. And it's kind of like, I want to make sure that Georgia doesn't get the wrong idea, that other states don't get the wrong idea, that other states don't start to believe that this is okay because you saw Georgia do it, now you can do it. And now this is something that we're fighting everywhere. No, 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 no. So for me, um, I am going to be connecting with other activists down in Atlanta and I'm taking some busloads of people from Chicago down to Atlanta. And we're gonna go and knock on the governor's door and see how many of us can fit in a jail cell. Are you gonna lock us all up? Can we all catch a federal case for knocking on your door? Cause I know I'm sure gonna knock. I think, and people say, you know, we stand, we stand with, uh, we stand with Park. We stand with that state rep who knocked on the door. We stand with her. 
No, she doesn't want you to stand with her. That's not what they did in the 60s. They didn't just stand together. They sat together in jail cells. If that's what it took, that, that's what they did. And I think that's what it's going to take for us. You thinking about taking some lawn chairs to the governor's mansion in Atlanta? Oh, what? I'm taking a barbecue grill and some lawn chairs. I'm yeah. definitely going to barbecue on his corner. You think I'm not when I really am? I'm definitely going to pull up with a barbecue grill. Because what else am I going to do? This is happening. The, the, look, bro, the best thing you can do is just go ahead and answer the door. We got to talk about this whole voter thing because we're not leaving. We got food out here. You start a barbecue grill, you're going to have a block party. That's what you're going to have. And we're going to be out here. We're going to have, I mean, an anti-voter suppression party. That's what we're going to have. So when you see 10 of us, we're going to call our friends. Everybody has been vaccinated. We're going to have masks, all of these things. We're going to do all of this. But we must, we have to really push back against this. And we have to push back in a really aggressive way. I agree. Can you talk a little bit about what has happened on the block uh, since we wrapped filming and more specifically since the pandemic started? Okay, so this is, do you know, you ever heard that song, that kid, the song that people sing their kids, it's like a, a nursery rhyme. I know an old lady. It's like, I know an old lady who swallowed a bird. I don't know why she swallowed. And it's all of these things. That's what I feel like happened on the block. Like, like there was a pandemic, they built the school, then they built the school and then the kids did e-learn. It was just a lot. But um, when, well, before the pandemic, after the movie wrap, it's not a vacant lot there anymore. We actually built the school on that lot out of shipping containers retrofitted as classrooms because the idea was an African-American educational renaissance. I figure if black people could produce some of the greatest minds that that this country has, this world has ever seen out of one room schoolhouses um, in the South, why can't we do that again? So um, like kids like Jermaine, who you met in the movie, we sent them to trade school. We wanted to give them a third option. So we took the kids who were the most likely to kill or be killed and we sent them to trade school and we paid them to go. And basically we did this experiment. It was like an experiment and it was time management cut down on violent crime. That's it. We just took away their time. They, they didn't have time to shoot anybody or time to get shot. And in the process, they learned to trade. And then when they came out, there were jobs waiting on them. There were training, other trainer programs waiting. There were other opportunities waiting. So we had so many kids wanted to get into the program that Jermaine was like, hey, you know what? We need to just do one. Of, we need to build one of these ourselves for the kids on the block, for the young people there, for people on the south side who want to come and, and, you know, get the opportunity that we got. So we built this school out of shipping containers, which is insane in itself. And it, 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 that was completely bought on because I never sleep. And that is what happens when you don't sleep and you watch HGTV all night. I mean, insomnia and HGTV is what happens. That's, that's how that, that's what happened. That's how this school happened. So we built this school and Jermaine, with him having a trade, he was one of the leads. He was the project lead. We built the school. And right before we were supposed to open in, um, in March, April of last year, the pandemic hit. And so now we have all of these kids who aren't in school. And the thing with masks is if the kids are out, we're out. If the kids aren't in school, we're outside on the corner. So, okay, so now what do we do? And so we have this space now, we have these classrooms but these were classrooms for a trade school. This was for young adults, for, for you know, older learners. And um, my cousin said, well, Noah, it's raining and you built the ark. And she said, these kids gotta go to school and you gotta open the doors. So we ended up having to redo the classrooms for younger kids. So every day since March 17th of last year, we've had kids in our classroom every day, like literally up until like just this afternoon, every day we have. And they do their e-learning there and um, they get two hot meals a day. They get supervision. 
And a lot of the parents in that neighborhood are essential workers who aren't, you know, the very well paid essential workers, the people who didn't have the options of working from home, who, you know, go, they do Instacart, they do Uber Eats and Grubhub. And they were faced with the choice of, I mean, it, it's, it's impossible of leaving their like six year old and their four year old in the care of their nine year old or losing their job. And so we didn't want that to happen. So we decided, hey, you can just bring your kids to us and we'll we'll help them out here. And so um, we just wanted to be a support to the community. And so what that actually ended up doing, we actually ended up seeing um, where kids really were in terms of their education. So we were able to help them kind of get caught up and get to grade level. Some of them, we were able to help some of them exceed grade level. And even since CPS has actually went back into the classroom, all of our parents have elected to keep their kids in our classrooms. So like tomorrow, I'm so proud, like tomorrow we start violin lessons together, like violin lessons, like I'm going to be a beginner and violin with the kids. I'm so excited about that. But we, we have, we do um, virtual learning. We do all sorts of stuff with these kids. So they get they get a lot more opportunities with a smaller class classroom size than they would in a CPS classroom. So they learn different. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just really happy that we got to do that. Not happy about the pandemic, but I'm happy that we got to become a bit more multifaceted. I'm going to open this up. There's some questions from the audience that I want to ask you. Uh, what do you see as your next steps? um my next steps i think the next steps is pretty much just expansion so now like we're going to be building another school in memphis and we're doing stuff there and then we're going to be going to little rock and then we we are just we're expanding we're doing stuff in a lot of different places and then um of course we have this this voter suppression thing that we're pushing back on too and that's like a major part of it and we're going to get the kids involved in that too they're learning about that now and so um, I think that's the next thing that we're going to be tackling. And can you give us an update about your uh, status as a rabbinical student versus an ordained rabbi? Okay. I haven't been a rabbinical student in almost a decade. And I, I was done a long time ago. And I wasn't ordained because I'm a woman. But now that has all changed. Uh, delayed is no longer denied. So I have been offered smicha and I will be ordained July 24th of this year. Uh, what about politics? Do you ever consider, I mean, you remember in the film, we, we had the, the gentleman Jesse. who appears, Jesse, yes. who appears twice to uh, talk to you about running for office. And it's something that we have talked about in the past, but what do you think right now about running for office? And that was only twice that you filmed. There I you mean, that was only- He's there all the time. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think that, not, not right now, not right now. Politics are so toxic right now in this country. And honestly, it is it's way too violent for me right now. I don't, if, if something happened to me, as a politician, I don't even think my insurance would pay out. Like it's super dangerous to be a politician right now. Like, no, not gonna do it. And I wanna do big things. I wanna help help people make big changes in their lives. And sometimes you can't do that when you're in a red state or a blue state or you have a D or R behind your name, you can't. And I, if things are so tribal right now and people are so dug into you know, their ideas and their beliefs of what's right and, and, and it holds us back. So no, it, politics will only get in the way. I want to do big things and I can't do them with the smallness that exists in politics right now. Fair enough. There's a question uh, that I'm going to answer. And the question is, how did you decide on the title for the film? So the film, as everyone on the call knows, is called They Ain't Ready For Me. And the title is from a line in a song by Bruno Mars that at the 4th of July party, when we were filming, Tamar and Kendra were dancing to the song and I was, we were filming them and I'm watching them and I hear the words, they ain't ready for me. And I thought to myself, this is the title of the film. And I walked up to Tamar and I said, they ain't ready for me. 
that's what we're calling this. And you said, yeah, that's what we're going to call this. And I think it's pretty spot on. I, I, I think so too. Once, once I picked it, I never sort of looked back and said like, oh, maybe we should call it something else. Or no, this always just seemed like perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see there. So there's a question. Um, let's, let's put it this way. How does mass get funded? Uh, through mostly high donations, $18, $36, you know, you get it. Um, we don't really get any funding from large foundations or anything like that. And we don't get anything from the government, local, state, federal, nothing. nothing and I kind of like it that way. And um, we just get, we are just like crowdfunded by people who believe in us. People come and see what we do. They hear about our work. It's just very grassroots, that's it. So people believe in what we do. They like what we do, so they donate. And I mean, sometimes they come down and actually visit their money on the block. They can do that, it's that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's a very grassroots thing. What about money from the state or federal or local governments? Oh, no, I said I don't get any of that. And I actually don't want any of it from them. No, thank you. Can you speak a little about uh, whether the organized Jewish community in Chicago, the main quote unquote mainstream or white Jewish community in Chicago interacts with mask or, or does it? Um, there's a pretty large Jewish community in Chicago. I mean, and some do and some don't. And I mean, but I don't necessarily um, concentrate on those who don't. So I, I tend to care more about the people who do interact with us than the people who don't. And I pay more attention to the people who do than the people who don't. I just do that. So I can tell you that I'm very proud of um, how much interaction and how much involvement, the level of involvement of the Jewish community in Chicago that I see like, you know, every day on the block and just in what we do in mask every day. Um, but as far as the Jewish community on a whole, I really don't pay attention to that. Like I pay attention to the people who help, not necessarily the, the community in its entirety. Uh, that being said, the JCC in Chicago has screened our film twice and is going to screen it again and has been generous in helping get the word out about mask and about the world, about the work that you do. Yeah. Uh, somebody is asking, will the film be screened in Canada and available on streaming services? Uh, right now we're doing the Jewish film festival circuit. Uh, we have a distributor, Manemsha Films, out of uh, Los Angeles. They've been great at getting the film around the country. I think we screened in Vancouver. I'm not sure about other places. I think maybe there was a synagogue or two in Canada, but I don't think there's uh, a specific plan for Canada. And in terms of uh, streaming services or video on demand, I think that's the next step once we finish uh, the circuit that we're on now. But for now, we're doing these uh, community screenings and they've been going well, despite the fact that we don't get to actually visit the communities except virtually. Um, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, we've been pretty happy with, with how it's going so far. And uh, I'm going to throw out one more question tomorrow and i guess you and i can both answer this but i'll let you since i'm going to ask uh what's next and will there be a follow-up to this uh well yes because this is just like i said a b plus film we have to make an a minus film now all right let's shoot for an a let's shoot for at least an a yes. so, yeah so you and i have talked about this and we're we're deep in planning for a follow-up to the film and uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what it will be um, this film is going to be about um, how the Black Jewish community is the bridge between the Black community and the Jewish community and the white Jewish community, that, that Black Jews are the bridge. There is no going around us or over us or under us. You have to go through us. That's just how it goes. And this movie is about, it's, it highlights that. It highlights what an asset the Black Jewish community is to the Jewish people in its entirety it how much it enhances it so when we talk about really building bridges and really honestly truly 
um, building relationships and getting back to this, this idea of what Rabbi Hashu and Dr. King built. We have to have a conversation within the Jewish community about um, how do we get there? How do we get to the black community? Well, first, the Jewish, the black Jewish community and the not black Jew, non-black Jewish community have to have a conversation. We have to have an in-house conversation. And this movie kind of is about that. It's 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 about it's about the bridge building. That's what it's about. Yeah, I, I think for me, uh, this the first film that we did, uh, I was focused more on the work that you do uh, on the block. And of course, the Jewish aspect is important, but I wanted, at least in the first film, the, the work to come across more. And the second film is going to be, as you said, more focused on uh, the role that black Jews can play uh, as bridge builders between the African-American and the Jewish communities. And especially, I feel like that is a timely film and it's always timely. Uh, whether we make it this year or next year or five years from now, we're still going to be faced with the same issues. But I think that uh, one of the goals that I have of that film is to help solve some of these issues. And maybe, you know, five, 10 years from now, we won't have the same issues that, that our communities face today. And that's certainly my hope. Right. I think that's mine, too. That's mine, too. All right. I think we're coming up against uh, nine o'clock. Or yeah, um, we're we're across three time zones here. Um, I want to yeah, I want to thank uh, you both, Brad and Tamar, for taking the time to talk with us. It was a really meaningful film, and I was really drawn to creating communities and really inspired to hear about the community that is thriving in the the school right now. That was yeah, that was incredible to hear about. Um, you can keep up with uh, Skirball's programs on our website, skirball.org. Um, of note, we're looking at a May 15th public opening with Ai Weiwei's exhibit, Trace. So please keep up with on our website about that. And thank you all for tuning in. And I hope you all have lovely evenings. <laughs> thank you, Brad and Tamar. Good night, everyone. Thank you for having us. Bye.